Alrighty, so how did PA2 end up? So I started grading this morning. I'm grading from the back going forward. Um, and so far, they look good. So, seven submissions missing. I sent individual emails to each person whose submission was missing. So, if you got an email from me um, and you don't know how to correct that, come and talk to me. So, I had hours this morning, which a few people came by for. I have hours from 12 to 12.30. And if that doesn't work, I teach in room 126 from 2 to 4. Probably 2.15 to 3.15, I should be available in there. If you come by, just uh, come over and we can work on it. If you're having trouble getting things pushed or opening things up. So, two ODPs. Um, queued up. One of them opened this morning and is due tomorrow morning. Um, and this ODP asks you to implement a hash function. It's not the hash function from PA3, it's just a different hash function. Um, but it's the same basic setup. It's a function that takes a string and returns an integer. So, um, prototype looks like this. Right, car star is a string. Um, and the goal of the, f the, the way the function works is basically just add up all the ASCII values of each character in your string and then reduce mod 31. So it should return a value between 0 and 32. And there's some samples. If you hash this character A, you should get a 3. If you hash ABC, you should get 12, and so on. Um, it depends on case, right? Uppercase, lowercase, have different ASCII codes. Um, and if you're writing your main program to test this and you're using fgets to read in a string, remember that your fgets puts a backslash and a new line at the end of your string. So if you, if you say fgets temp and you type in hello and then try to hash temp, you're not hashing H-E-L-L-O, you're hashing H-E-L-L-O with a backslash n. And you'll get a 10 instead of a 0 in that case. So um, general principle. This is weird. I feel like my window has shrunk. I'll try that. Uh, general principle. So if you have If you have a string with a new line at the end and you want to get rid of that new line, right, this is bracket 0, this is bracket 5, string length of temp is 6, right, H-E-L-L-O and a new line that's 6 characters. So the last character is always character string length minus one. Okay, this is this funny thing about arrays with, with index uh, zero. Number of things in the array minus one gives you the index of the last element. So if you want to remove the last character from a string, you can do it with this. says tell me how many characters, subtract one, take the character at that index, and set it equal to the null terminator. And that will simply replace the backslash n with a backslash zero, and now your string looks like H-E-L-L-O. So that's a general trick you can use lots of places. All right, so that's, that's your, your ODP, right? This hash function that adds up the ASCII codes, reduces modulo 31. Make a running sum, keep adding.
and then link it with the test bed as usual and assess it as usual. Any worries on that? Okay, cool. So, um, midterm on Friday. So, midterm is basically going to be linked lists and structures. Um, and I think that's all I'm going to test you on. Linked lists and structures and code that goes along with making linked lists and so on and so forth. So, it will probably be a batch of short programming questions. Um, but we've been doing linked lists for four weeks, so I think it's it's the main subject up to this point. We're starting to talk about hashes. I'm not going to test you on hashes for the midterm because um, this is your first ODP and, and so on and so forth. Um, so just, just link lists. So if um, I'm hoping to get most of PA2 graded today, tomorrow, um, but you probably know if your code basically works or not. I might catch some edge case that you don't know about, but that's not a huge deal. But, you know, if you couldn't get your code to compile or you run it and it doesn't insert nodes or it, it seg faults when you delete or something, you probably know that there's an issue in the code, right? You've got to come talk to me. Okay, we've got to sit down. We've got to go through your code. We've got to go into GDB. We've got to work through it, see what the algorithm is, um, and, and figure out uh, what's what. And that's really good prep for the midterm, okay, and it's really essential for PA3 and especially PA4, um, which will go back to heavy duty manipulation of memory at runtime. Um, but PA3, it's a hash where you're using linked lists in each node, so you got to have lists working for that anyway. Um, so, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday mornings, the last chance to turn in PA2. So, I'll probably go over PA2 Wednesday in class um, and look at code. All right, so let's, let's talk about PA3, so your hash assignment. Um, Let's talk about some of these hash functions and maybe look at some pseudocode. So we've still got our struct nodes. Struct node star is a node in our linked list. And since our hash table is an array of sentinel nodes, right, we can call this thing the struct node star a hash entry. And then your hash table. is an array of hash entries. So your hash table is an array of hash entries. Um, so this hash init function should take an integer that says how big should our array be and it returns basically the address of that array, right? Which is a, a pointer to a hash entry.
So what, what do we do? We want to um, allocate space for an array of this size of hash entries. So do that with malloc. And what do we want to malloc? Well, we want to malloc size times however big a single hash entry is, which is size of hash entry. Okay, so this is what a single element of your array is. It is a hash entry, which is a pointer to a struct node. See how big that is, multiply by how many of them you want, that's how many bytes of memory you need. And this will return the address of that first byte, so it's the address of table bracket zero. So we can save that in table, and that's going to be what we return. So that's setting up your initial array. But you gotta do a little more work. Because when you allocate memory, you don't know what the contents of that memory is. So you need to go through and set up each entry in your array to be the sentinel node of an empty list. Okay, how do we get the sentinel node of an empty list? Call the init function for the linked list. So um, you have a list init function which creates an empty linked list and returns the sentinel, right, the address of the sentinel node. So if I say something like table bracket zero equals list init. Right, list init should go down into my list routine, call malloc, create a new node, set the next field to null, maybe set the data field to something significant, return its address. Table bracket zero will be equal to that address, so it will have the address of the sentinel node of an empty linked list. And if I do this, Same thing, list init will call malloc again, which will make a new sentinel node, initialize its fields, return its address, table bracket one will be the address of that new sentinel node. I now have two lists in memory. I can get to the elements of the first list through table bracket zero, second list through table bracket one. And so you want to do this up through size minus one. All right, so make a for loop or something and iterate. And when you're done, you should have a total of size linked lists, each of them empty, with a sentinel node of each list stored in this array called table. And now you have access to each of your linked lists through those sentinel nodes. And that's all you need for most of what you're going to do because most of your list functions, list add, list find, need a pointer to the sentinel node. Well, that's just an entry from your table. So if I want to add something to the third link list, I just pass it table bracket two. And that's the sentinel node of that list. If I want to search for something in the fifth link list, I call list find, but I pass it table bracket six, because that's the fifth, or table bracket four, because that's the fifth link list. So everything you're doing with lists is, is just like stuff you were doing in your main program in PA1, PA2. Um, you just have to know which linked list to work with, right? I want to find a license plate ABC123. What element of table points to the list that I should look for? Well, that's what your hash function does. You take your license plate, you run it through this function, you get back an integer between 0 and size minus 1, and that's the index of table that you use to get to your linked list. Does that make sense? So, when you show this example, sometimes there will be multiple, um, like, 
license plates in one index, mm -hmm. how would that work? Would there just be multiple um, pointers inside? So, so when you get a license plate and you run it through that hash function, you get an index, right? You're going to get some index between 0 and size minus 1, right? If you've only got 20 entries in your hash table and you've got 1,000 license plates, you're going to have multiple things hashing to the same location, right? Which means your lists are going to grow. So, so first plate that hashes to one, I'm going to add that to the list. It's going to be a list with just that node. If I get another plate that also hashes to a value of one, I'm going to add that plate to the same list. Now that list is going to have two things, and so on. So um, the list can be variable length from zero up to who knows. All right, there's one other detail in here. For example, when you call hash add or you call hash find, um, well, no, actually, those don't matter. When you call hash add or hash find or anything else, um, you're going to need to use the hash function to take a license plate, turn it into an index, right? Your hash function needs to know the size of your hash table. And the only time you tell anything what the size of the hash table is is when you call hash init. So when you say hash add and you get a license plate and you want to figure out what index it's stored and you try to run it through the hash function, how does the hash function know what the table size is? So you've got to save it somewhere. Okay. Now I could, I could tell you to pass the hash size to your hash add function into your hash find function, into your hash load function, right? And you could use it in there, but we don't want to be passing around a lot of things. And the cleanest way to do this is to make my hash table a structure that's not just a pointer to a hash entry, but a structure that has a pointer to a hash entry and a hash size and maybe some other stuff. But we're taking an easier approach. Um, to this, which is we're going to use the dreaded global variable, but it's not going to be global throughout your entire program. It's going to be global throughout the hash functions. So assuming that you put all your hash functions in a separate file like hash functions.c or something, which I strongly recommend, um, here's what we can do. Inside your function, but out inside your file, but outside of any function, we can say something like integer hash table size. Okay, this is global from this point of your file on down. If this is all inside something called hash.c, then any function from this point on down in my file has access to this variable hash table size. You're going to have a different .c file for every hash function. Would you want to use an extern? Then you'd want to use an extern and, and uh, uh, yeah. And that gets a little more complicated. All right, so we make this, this variable that's global inside this file. And then in here, when you call hash in it, you just say the following. Hash table size equals size. <coughs> and here we're just saving for future use. And now in your hash function, assuming you define your hash, function somewhere below here, it can just access hash table size and it gets this value right here. And this is, this is the one place where for this class global variables are appropriate. Okay, you'll still get zero points if you do this at WSU. <coughs> but, um, but for here, this is an appropriate use of a global. Why wouldn't we just put it in the structure? because I didn't want to make the structure even more complex. But that would be the right way to do it. And that, that moves us towards 
doing objects in 223 where all of this would be bundled in one thing. But the way that you do objects is very natural, and, and the way you do objects in C without the plus plus is kind of cumbersome, um, <coughs> especially for a first pass, I think. What's cumbersome? Like, what's the difference? Because I got the difference you can't have methods in there, but is it, is it more difficult in C than C++ plus plus these objects? Because instead of being a, a pointer to a hash entry, it's a pointer to a, a hash table which is a structure which is a pointer to a hash entry and an integer and the hash entry is a pointer to a struct node and the dereferencing I think for 222 is just heavy. It's mainly the, the asterisks that I worry about. So, so <laughs> when you don't have to speak in the language of pointers you can just say this is a hash entry which is a, a array of linked lists, right? And, and an integer and an array of linked lists is just a header node that has a node and a integer. Um, I think it's easier to swallow sometimes. All right, does this make sense? So when you initialize your hash table, you tell your code how big you want the hash table to be, save that in a variable that's global inside that hash.c file, okay, or from that point of your code on down. What we don't want to do is in our main program, right, right before our main, we don't want to say integer hash table size because now we've got a variable which, which the user has to declare outside their main program and is not allowed to use anywhere else and is not allowed to rename and so on and so forth. Can we just initialize it in our header file and then, then give it a value later on? If you initialize it in your header file, it's going to be local to every file that you include that header in. But you could have a special header with include guards that just only, it only appears in your hash. Right, so right. That's what I'm going to do probably. It's easier to next turn. Okay. Yeah, that works. Just make sure that's okay. Yeah. Okay. The only thing I don't want you to do is the following. This is our main.c or plate.c or whatever. I don't want you to do I don't want you to make a global outside of your main program. All right. So think of this as a package you are making for a user. You're going to hand them this thing called hash. Right, hash.c or compiled version hash.o, and to use it, they can just say things like, you know, hash entry star table equals hash init parentheses 100, right? And it will take care of remembering that the hash table is 100, and when they call, um, show me the load of each cell, it'll automatically iterate through 100 cells and show them the load in each one, and so on and so forth without having to have some magic global variable that the user has to define in their main program. Right? So think about this as, as you're going to hand this hash function to somebody else and they want to just interact with it through this relatively short list of functions, hash init, hash add, hash find, hash load, hash dump, and hash free. And those are the only things the user wants to do with your hash. Okay, this is, this is important, um, that you interface with your hash through exactly these functions. Now, if you want to make additional functions in your hash.c, that's fine, right? You probably will want to make additional functions. But your main program should only have to use these functions to interact with your hash. Your main program should never say, you know, for i equals 0 to 100, if hash table bracket i dot such and such, right? That's not something that belongs in your main program. Okay, that belongs in your hash functions. So if you're developing this and you're not sure about that line between caller and called code, right? Come and talk to me. It's easier to pin down with specific examples than, than generalities.
right, let me make a comment about valve grind at this point. Um, Let's just make some nodes. So this, this is code that doesn't do anything particularly interesting, but we're malloking a node, right? Size of struct node. We're sending the data, not the date, equal to 10. And then we're going to go into our usual for loop where we start to see if this is pointing to something else. And if it is, we'll print out the data field. And when we're done, we're going to free temp, which should give us no memory leaks. Whoa, look at all that. So we can run that, it doesn't do anything. Let's val grind it. And it tells me heap summary in use at exit, zero bytes, all heaps freed, no leaks possible. That's fine. That's that's what we're after. But we got this message up here also. Okay. Conditional jump remove depends on uninitialized values. Um, these are problems, okay? I'm not taking off points for those in PA2, but PA3 forward I will, okay? So you really want to make sure that when you run your code through Valgrind, the only thing you see at the end is this, right? And none of these things. And in some cases, right, you can get 20 or 30 or 20 or 30,000 of these messages. And they tell you something is wrong in your code. Okay, now your code may be working correctly, but that's partially through luck, right? Because this is telling you that there's something going on that shouldn't be. Usually what this means is you have a value that's not initialized. Um, what's going on here is I'm looking at the value of temp arrow next, right here. And I've never initialized temp arrow next. I created a new node temp, which is completely uninitialized data. I set the data field equal to 10. That takes care of this. I haven't done anything to put a value in this field. And then I use that value and see if it's equal to some other value. It's an uninitialized value. Now, I luck out that when I malloc on this machine, things I haven't given a value to are equal to null. But that's not guaranteed. And it's not necessarily going to work on another machine or on another day. So if you calloc here, that would fix the problem? If you calloc, I think that will fix the problem. Um, but the other way is just make sure you give everything a value. Right? So that when you run it, you just get that nice succinct message with a heap summary saying all heaps were freed, all heap blocks.
Right, so here's here's a sample main loop for a main program. Um, buffer of 120 characters, read it from the user and print out high until they put in something that begins with the letter X. Um, hello, bye. X, and when I type in X, it kicks me out, which it should. Um, right, but when I run this, I'm getting this error message again from Valgrind. I'm not doing any malics, right? But it's still telling me I have an uninitialized value. And that uninitialized value is, is inside my main program. I'm curious. Right, so if I compile it with the dash G switch, it tells me main.c line 12, conditional jump or move depends on uninitialized values. So go down to line 12, and it's at this while statement right here. Well, what am I comparing? I'm comparing element 0 of buffer to the character x. x is defined, it's just a character. Buffer 0 must be undefined. Well, it is. I declared a character array. And I never gave buffer bracket zero a value. It's possible, maybe one out of 256 times, that when I run my program, it's going to exit the first time through because it just so happens that buffer is pointing to the character x somewhere in memory. Right? So what's, what's the usual way to deal with this? Right? Do your fgets before your loop. See if it's equal to zero, and then um, do your f gets inside the loop, usually at the bottom, to get the value for a buffer the next time you go back to the top of the while. Is that good? So we know what, what hash init does basically, right? It's really just a loop around, it, it's a malloc to make your hash table and it's a loop around um, multiple calls to list init. Okay, list init you've coded. So let's look at hash add. <laughs> Hash add is a hash table. And then you pass it a license plate, a first name, and a last name. Give it your hash table, give it three pointers to characters, your license plate, your first name, and your last name. Um, and you can start writing lots of code that, that starts dealing with pointers and currents and nexts, and if this node's bigger than that and all this kind of stuff, you don't want to do any of that. Okay. You want to use your linked list functions to make your life easier. So, what are the steps in here? Um, so, hash your plate to find an index in the hash table. Okay, I'm using hash as a verb here. To hash a plate means to take the license plate and turn it into 
an entry, an index in the hash table to convert it into an integer. And the way we do this is we run through the hash function. So you're going to write a function like what you're doing for the ODP today, right, which takes a character array and does this calculation on it and returns that value as a function value. So you're going to make a function integer hash takes an argument car star plate. All right, so hash the plate to find the index <coughs> in the hash table. Let's call this index i. Call it something better than i. Call it location in hash table or something. Um, and then how do we add? So, so if we get back index i from the hash function, then hash table bracket i is a linked list to which we should add our data. So run your plate through the hash function, you know, one line of code, right? Get back an integer, we're calling it i. Hash table bracket i is a linked list that we want to add our data into. Okay, and, and multiple ways to look at this, right? Hash table bracket i, well, technically, it's a pointer. It's an address in memory, okay? It's the address of a struct node. So we can think of it as the address of a struct node we can think of it as, you know, a struct node, since it's a reference to a struct node, which is a sentinel. Or we can think of it as a linked list, a big long chain of nodes, right? The technically correct interpretation is it's a pointer to memory, where we find the beginning of the struct node that is the sentinel of a linked list. But once we're comfortable with this, we just think of this as a linked list. Right? If we have to know where that is in memory, we got to go back and say this is a pointer. It points to a location, which is the first byte of the struct node that makes the sentinel, blah, blah, blah. It's a linked list, okay? In the sense that any of these list functions that require a linked list, like add or find or length, we can pass it hash table bracket i. When we want to add a plate, a first name, and a last name to a list, that's what list add does. It takes the sentinel node, the plate, first name, and last name. So this is nothing more than list add hash table bracket i, comma plate, comma first, comma last. Give you actual code. So that's all there is to your hash add function. Right? That's that's what you need. Call hash, pass it your plate, get back an integer. Use that integer to look up a list in hash table, pass that along with the data you want to add to your list add function and return. You can do this in one line of code. You can just say list add parentheses hash table bracket hash parentheses plate close parent close bracket comma plate comma first comma last. Put that in curly brackets you're done with hash add. And this is how most of your hash functions are going to look. Most of the functions in your hash package are going to look. So this is, this is modularizing, right? This is not reinventing the wheel again and again. This is saying I already have something that adds to a linked list. Here's a linked list. Here's something I want to add to the linked list. Here, magic list add function, do this for me. And it does it for you.
and then hash find, exactly the same thing. We want to look for a license plate in our hash table, hash the plate to an integer, call your list find with hash table bracket, whatever that integer was, that's your sentinel node, pass it plate first and last. And your list find does exactly what we wanted to. It takes a plate first and last and a sentinel node. And if it finds the plate, it updates first and last name with the relevant first and last name and it returns a one. Otherwise it returns a zero. So here's the one line version of hash find. So call list find, what do we want to pass? The address of a sentinel node, that's just hash table, bracket. Well, where do we find our sentinel node in the hash table? Whatever our hash function returns when we hash the plate. And then pass it plate first and last. Now you don't have to write it like this, right? Put it in steps, use temporary variables, put in comments, make sure you understand what's happening. But functionally, this is all that your hash find has to do. Find where your plate's stored in the hash table, look up a sentinel node in hash table, pass that along with plate first and last to list find. List find will update these variables if it finds the plate in that linked list. And list find will return a one in that case, in which case hash find will return a one. And if the plate is not found in the list, list find will leave these unchanged, in which case hash find will leave these unchanged. List find will return a zero, in which case hash find will return a zero. So you get exactly this desired behavior, which is return a one or a zero, and if it's a one, update. Hash load, you got to write a little code for because the goal is to go through every cell in your hash table and print out the length of each linked list. Well, for i equals 0 to table size minus 1, how do we find the list of the list corresponded to hash table bracket i? Just call list len. Takes a sentinel node, tells you how many things are in the list. So that's a print with the return value of list len as you iterate send from hash table zero through hash table size minus one. And then hash dump is just a call to free to, uh, to list print. And hash free is a loop that calls list free for each entry in the list and then frees the hash table itself at the very end. All right, so we're out of time. Um, but that, that should get you going on implementing some of these functions. Let's talk about the list functions tomorrow.